Okay, so while we're waiting for Grace to finish uh, getting her notes together, um, we're going to record a book report with my son, Joshua. So, Josh, tell us your full name. Joshua Gregory Potts. Okay, and the the date? Uh, 2018, March 4th. Okay, what's the title of the book that you're giving your report on? Case File 13, Zombie Kid. Zombie Kid. Yes, you could just call it Zombie Kid. Okay. okay. It's part of a series. I think so, yes, because it says Volume 1. So the series is Case Files 13? I'd have to find that, figure have, that out. We have to look I, that I don't, up. I don't really know. But you've only got one book by this by this author, correct? Yes, and luckily it's Volume 1, so. Okay. So um, the author, what's the author's name? J. Scott Savage. Tell us a little bit about, about the author in the book. I can read that out loud. Um, yeah, why don't you, why don't you read the, the, the little bit about the author? Okay. Just a second. J. Scott, J. Scott Savage has been hunting and writing about monsters for as long as he can remember. His mother, his mother believes that his first one might have been, been, um, L-Y-C-A-N-T-H-R-O-P-E. <laughs> That's a lycanthrope? Lycanthrope. Okay, the, his first one not even lycanthrope. Do, and the do first, you know what that means? No. That's a werewolf. Oh, first one might have been lycanthrope, and the first thing he he bought with the money he had delivering newspapers was a six-foot plastic Frankenstein monster. <laughs> okay. Currently, he lives with his undead wife, Jennifer, and his shape-changing sons, Jacob and Nicholas. His undead wife? Yes, I, I think this is like, this book is all fantasy, and this guy literally likes monsters, so I think he's writing, like, um, um, I, I'm not In sure. In character? Which. Yes. Yeah, okay. So, shape-changing sons, Jacob and Nicholas, and a colleague named Pepper that howls at full moons and joins him on his freaking midnight graveyard excursions. Oh, wow. Okay. When he's not researching grizzly and gruesome facts, he enjoys reading, writing, and exploring the outdoors. Savage is also the author of the middle grade fantasy series, uh, Fantasy Series Followed. You can visit it online at jscottsavage.blogpost.com. Blogspot. Oh, okay, blogspot. Oh, sorry. Or follow him on Twitter, AJ, J. Scott Savage. Okay, cool. All right, so... Who are the main characters in this book, and what can you tell me about each of these characters? Um, Into the mic. Right Nick in. is a, a young boy who's li- been living a normal life up until this book, basically. <laughs> up until this book. Okay. And Kaida is a guy, he's just a fat pig. He can't stop eating, <laughs> no matter what happens. He just eats and eats and eats. Like, even if he's scared, he just eats and eats. He got a big stash of Halloween candy from last Halloween, and he just keeps on eating. He's still eating his Halloween candy. Yes, after, like, f- six weeks. Okay. So this book... Uh, oh, I think he stole some... His, his little sister's con- <laughs> candy? I'm not really sure. I can't quite remember. Um, okay. And Angelo is really smart. He has, like, monster notebooks. He makes models of vampires and stuff like that and paints them up and all that. So who are the, th- the three kids again? They're all three boys? Nick, Carter, and Angelo. Okay. So, uh, brief summary. Brief summary. Uh, one day, Nick went to his aunt's funeral. When he was there, he got a voodoo kiss and turned into a zombie. S- oh, so <laughs> I'm trying to... <laughs> okay. So he and his friends need to go to the Zombie King to lift the kiss. Zombie King? Yes. Okay, very exciting. My favorite part is when they find out Nick's a zombie because um, the, um, Angelo says, you're a zombie. And then they just both sit in silence for about five minutes and then they both yell at the same time, awesome! Awesome? They think it's awesome to be a <laughs> yes, zombie? Yes, but, but later they find out it's not that awesome at all. Yeah, well, uh, it doesn't sound awesome to me. Yes, but they're obsessed with monsters, so they're like, awesome! So they're super into monster stories, so yeah. to them it's cool to be a zombie. Yeah. Well, uh, Nick probably didn't feel the way. Well, well, all three of them said awesome, so maybe oh. Nick felt that at first, but like, maybe later on he found out it's really not funny at all. Okay. Uh, and is that your favorite part of the story? Yeah, and the reason I like the book is because it's all fantasy. The zombies, voodoo curses, a cat that can talk, it's really awesome. I know you had a little concern. You were wondering if you were the right age level for the book. 
Oh yes, because it kind of it's kind of a little bit gruesome. I actually have been looking for some evidence of evidence, uh, whatever that word is. Evidence. Um, evidence of what the age level should be, and I finally found little words in the book that said ages eight to twelve, I think. And how old are you? I'm uh, nine. So you So I think I'm old enough to read it. So you're you're part of the book's targeted age group, but you yes, know what? Yes, but that's just a suggestion, though. Yeah. Now, if you feel the book is too gross or too old or I too... Didn't, I didn't really feel that way. Okay. But if you do, I mean, you don't have to keep reading it. You can... Yeah. Oh, yes. By the way, my dad told me to mention that I have not completely finished the book. You have not completely finished the book. You're, yes. what, two-thirds of the way through it? About? Uh, yeah, about. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, you would recommend this book or not? Um... I recommend The Age Suggestion if you ever buy it. It's kind of a good book. I like it. But maybe for maybe it's a little bit, you think, would be better for someone towards the upper end of that age range? Mm, yeah, like 9 or 12, or like 10 or 11 or 12. 10 or 11 or 12. Okay, thank you very much, Joshua. Wait, I also wanted to say some lines from the book. Oh, you're going you're gonna to read a little clip? Yeah. Okay, so just slowly and clearly, okay? Okay, I'll try. If I can find that page. So, Mr. Black Cam is not a person in the book. He's a librarian. Okay. Um, he's like, um, so in one of the parts, they're talking to him, and he says, perhaps we can discuss that another time, Mr. Black Cam said, but I'm afraid they're out late. Uh, and later, now, later, early in the book, uh, he promised his dad he'd help, his boss was coming over for for dinner tonight, and he and he promised to help him bring bring in furniture because they bought furniture from from his aunt Lenora's funeral. Um, they bought furniture from the old house. Okay. And so um, he promised to help. Yeah. And he said, "But I'm afraid you're a lot of weight." And he said, "Late for what?" And then his next next words are cut off by the ringing phone of on Mr. Blackham's desk desk. Okay. The librarian reached uh, the librarian reached for me for six stack of papers and pulled out a phone receiver that looked like fif- that looked at least 50 years old. Yes, he said holding the phone to his ear. He, I'll send him right away. Mr. Black Cam returned the phone to the stack of papers and smiled at Nick. It seems you are late for dinner. Now this moves on to the next chapter, but I'm not going to read the whole next chapter, just a little bit. Okay. Oh my gosh, Nick jumped up from the desk. He totally forgot that tonight his boss was coming over for dinner. He promised to help <laughs> clean up. Gotta go, he called to him, racing toward the door. Okay, very funny. All right, thank you very much, Josh, for the book report. I hope you'll do book reports for us uh, again in the future. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, take care. Okay, bye. Okay, we're back on the mics. Um, and, and we're recording now? We're recording. I did the bit oh. with Josh, so I do, I'll do. i do some editing. We don't do a lot of editing if we don't yeah. So we can jump to. right in. We can, we can do... We can jump right in. Yeah, I did a tiny like a microscopic amount of prep work. I wrote down like four questions, like a little handful of questions. Okay, why don't we why don't we ask our friend to introduce herself? Well, that's a good place to start. So Jules, tell tell the friendly audience <laughs> who you are. I'm Julie. I live in Torrington, Connecticut. Yep. Um I've known Grace and Paul since the beginning of time. Well, Grace since the beginning of time. <laughs> you make it sound yeah. like I'm old. Let me yeah, okay. <laughs> How, when did you meet Grace? I think it was the late 80s, early 90s. Yeah, it was uh, 1993. Oh, I oh. think I met you. Oh, was it that? Was it that late? But yeah, so any, I think we have a mutual we friend that introduced us. Rich. Yes, we met through Rich. But I, I think that was like 1990. Like, because I think 93... Oh well, gosh, maybe I'm getting confused now. Well, anyway, we, we don't. Need it was to a long time it, ago. Town, but you've and known each other to, yeah. for a long time, going back to when you were in school. Yeah, and we met at UConn at, at the oh, University of Connecticut. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's where we met at UConn. Yeah. Not in the UConn. Right. I, when Grace used to talk about UConn, I honestly, when I first met her, I was really puzzled because, like, re- really, you were in the oh, UConn? UConn? That's amazing. <laughs> Were you like, did you have like a dog sled? Were you hunting caribou? No, I was seriously the University confused. University of Connecticut. I honestly didn't know UConn was, the, you know, the, the, the funny 
the the jokey uh, abbreviation. That's just how we abbreviate it. But yes. the, the joke is that our mascot is a husky. Exactly. Right. That's the joke. Yeah. Um, which I think is only fitting. So Julie is also the um, godparent of our of our two, daughter. Our two, daughters. Two of our daughters. Two of our daughters. Yeah. Well, we only have two daughters. Yeah, so. The two daughters. All <laughs> two of our daughters. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. And we we wanted to uh, to chat with you today because you are an old school Doctor Who fan. Yeah, and we've kind of been we've been trolling old school Doctor Who. We've been so binging word, on uh, binging, not bin, trolling. Bin, not trolling. We've been binging on Doctor Who. We've been trawling. Trawling. I don't through, even know the lingo anymore. It's trawling terrible. through many many decades of of Doctor Who. Yeah. So you wrote down some questions. So why yeah. don't you start with this? I was what, curious because um, I know you're a fan and have been for a long time. What's your first memory of Doctor Who? When do you first remember watching Doctor Who? I watched it when I was in college. So when when I met Grace, I was in grad school. And right. Grace, Grace, you were working on your bachelor's degree. I yeah. actually started watching Doctor Who. I'm trying to remember if it was high. It was definitely college. I don't remember if it was high school. But I went to the College of New Rochelle. And mm-hmm. we used to always watch it. It was on PBS. Yep. One night a week. Which doctor at the time? Uh, it was Tom Baker. Okay. And that was my first introduction to Doctor Who was uh, Tom doctor Baker on PBS. Yeah. 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 On PBS. And so we would watch it every week. Mm. That's actually, that was about um, my experience. Right. I'm a few years younger. Um, when I, I was in, I would say 12 or so. Mm-hmm. maybe 11 12 and um i had a, a girlfriend who's who I'd, I'd go over to her house on weekends and her sister would watch tom baker doctor who right so this was about 1983 84 that i okay discovered. okay that was a few that was a few years later you were a few years yeah earlier so yeah. it okay. would have been about 80 for me i think mm-hmm. 79 80 oh okay yeah, no, I, I remember watching around 80, 83, 4. Okay. And 5. Tom, and, Tom Baker was the doctor for quite a few years. Yes, he was. And um, is he your favorite? Do you have a favorite doctor? Yeah. I, I think it's because when I started watching it, it was him. So he set the bar for me. Mm-hmm. Right. right. You know, What's that uh, mean? You never forget your first doctor? You never forget your first doctor. No, no. And as you know, I was really into it. I went to creation co- Doctor Who conventions when I was in college. Oh, really? Whoa. So what is yeah. what are those That's like? That's hardcore. What, well, yeah. they were a combination of Star Trek. So this was before they came out with Star Trek Next Generation and all yeah. that. So all there was was the original oh, series. The original and they series. had started to make the, the movies. Mm-hmm. And they would have these conventions that were a combination of Star Trek, Doctor Who, and they would have uh, some of the cast members there. So I met the guy who played Turlo, which was in the... Turlo. Um, was it the second Doctor? Da- Davidson. He was the fifth Doctor. Oh, Is okay. it John Davidson was his name? Uh, and Turlo was P- one Peter of the Peter Davidson. Companions. Peter Davidson was the fifth Doctor. Peter Davidson. Turlo was one of one of the companions, oh, and okay. I met him okay. at a creation oh, yeah. convention. Oh, cool. Creation convention. Yeah, and um, I got the knitting pattern for Tom Baker's scarf, which nice. I never finished, but I gave to you guys. Yes, <laughs> yes. Our son Isaac finished it and yes, wore it. He he's actually he's actually low grade famous around Ann Arbor for his scarf. Yeah, which was. <laughs> Long enough to trip over two or three times over. Yes, and but he was tall enough <laughs> yes. that it was like inches from the ground when right, he wore right. it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. But, well, it was like I mean wrapped around a couple times. It was like twenty feet long. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It was super. It was really funny. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So so um so Tom Baker was your first doc- doctor. Did, did they do costume? It was, is, did they have a equivalent of a costume ball at this at these conventions? Uh, Yes, people would dress up. I actually dressed up as him on Halloween when I was in college. Oh, cool. Because I always had a perm that I would normally just curl. Yes. <laughs> you know, that I, I would use a curling iron. But then right. when I did, I just let it go the perm way. And then I wore yeah. uh, 
I guess I wore a scarf and I dressed up as as him. A trench for, coat. Yeah. 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 I think and, I've seen pictures of this. Oh, really? I believe you have photographic evidence of this. <laughs> Okay, questions, Grace. Yeah, did, now, did you have did you have a favorite episode or storyline? Probably uh, the one where he meets Davros, and oh, okay, Davros gets him to tell him everything that's going to happen with the Daleks. Would mm-hmm. that would that be Remembrance of the Daleks? I'm not hundred percent sure. I I haven't watched it in a very long time, but. Okay. It, that's like the episode that comes to mind. Okay, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll have to see if I can I can dig up which which one you're talking about. But um, yeah, so Grace, your your um, impression of the Tom Baker years of Doctor Who when you would happen to stumble across it after school PBS were not so low. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it was low. I, I yeah, I'm kind. of hateful anyway but, well, but yeah no i i was never able to like get into Doctor you never it never clicked with you for whatever set I, of reasons i just couldn't yeah it was too it was just like too slow or something i could never i never got the hook and so I, I did not get invested in doctor who yeah, at the time yeah and i have to say for myself when i would see these episodes uh and you know i didn't watch them like every week so i wasn't really following the story that well mm-hmm but the um it had sort of the same issue for me where like i was really into the ideas of it yes i'm like oh this setup is really cool let's see what they do with it but then what they would mostly do with it would be running through corridors screaming and you know <laughs> it has its own charm but yeah <laughs> yeah and and then when you did see the monster the monster or the you know like, come on. By comparison to what I had been exposed to that was like set kind of set the bar for me was yeah. was Star Wars 1977 oh, or so, yeah. right? Oh yeah, Star Wars kind of. So the by comparison to that like the pace of these cliffhanger, you know, 30 minute 25 minute episodes and all right. that and sort of the quality of the sets and the and, and the um all that were head scratching honestly. Yeah. Well, so yeah. And I think you mentioned this last night. I think yeah. part of that pacing problem is the format itself. The twenty-five minute cliffhanger, right? Like you can't do enough in twenty-five minutes to really develop the whole story. Yeah, and but to stretch out like a small piece for twenty-five minutes, you've got to pad. You've got, you got to, to pad fifty it. minutes of padding. Yeah, and then so, you have to reintroduce it. So you have to end with the cliffhanger. And then Catch you start up. the episode, and you have to go back about you know what, thirty seconds or so right. previously on Doctor Who, Who, and bring bring people back in, help them remember what was happening. Yeah. So and then you've lost a couple minutes, and then it's like. But I get the impression that you were having, um, Julie, a, a communal experience with Doctor Who. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was a, I I had friends that were into it, and so we had black and white. I had a black and white TV. I. I can't remember if my friend did. Yeah. yeah when when would, I was in college, that would probably I make it better, honestly. Rabbit ears, black and white TV. <laughs> cool. <laughs> and uh, and we would watch it every week, and we would just be on the edge of our seat waiting to see what was going to happen next? in the next episode. I mean, I can see like the opening credits, I can see the theme music. Yeah, like, yeah. Open everything now in my brain, and we were there. We just. It, you, were you were you were there for it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was a member of the Doctor Who fan club. I, and oh, cool. I'm pretty sure I had a poster on my college wall somewhere. <laughs> in one of the four years. That's great. Okay. Now, what do you think of the reboot? I love the reboot. I I do have to confess that I haven't watched it after David Tennant. Oh, I, okay. I I don't think you're missing much. Yeah, I think it's okay. Yeah, I think it's okay. You can just keep watching David Tennant over and over again. <laughs> yeah, and I think you're all right. Well, and that's not that's not entirely fair to Matt Smith. Matt Smith has a few, um, has a few episodes that I really liked. Like there were there there's that whole period after Amy and Rory. There's several episodes with uh, River Song, mm-hmm. and there's a whole period after Amy and Rory where he's like um, in Victorian England. Some of those are fun. Yeah. Um and um. And who was after? Is it was Capaldi after Matt Smith, or was there someone? Yeah, Capaldi was after. Okay, yeah. and I've liked him generally, 
but I haven't liked the episodes. Overall, a lot of the episodes from Matt Smith, especially rewatching them and yeah. Capaldi, a lot of the episodes just don't really click. They don't quite work. They don't come right. together. And to me, um, the, the rebooted Doctor Who hit its peak with David Tennant and episodes like Blink, and oh, oh my god i love that but, episode that yeah. is, <laughs> i cannot look at an angel statue yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you go away and you look at it <laughs> yes it's ruined that public art for all episodes. <laughs> what's funny about that is that i don't think the producers really intended for that to be one of the best episodes it was a dr light episode where the doctor is actually off shooting other episodes and so the companion mostly has to hold it together along with some uh, uh, some extra cast right and actually the, I, there wasn't even like because i think the, was a was rose the companion at the time who was the companion? Because I don't even remember the companion that much. She, the companion is no. not is not the star of that episode. It's, right, it's like, this... it was. Um, it was. I think it was the the black girl who was the doctor. Oh yes, yes. I yeah. think she Martha was Jones. A- Martha Jones. So Martha Jones yeah. is was not in that episode. But they're barely. That much. They're both barely. They're barely in there. It. He, David Tennant appears mainly on those video clips that they find in the yes. uh, like in the extras so they were able for the to DVD stuff. Interview him or yeah. like have him on those clips for what fifteen minutes? However yeah, long it interacting to shoot that? with the characters, right? But it's this really these other actors, but in this brilliantly clever way. So right, it's a great story. That's that to me. That episode was a high water mark as far as really conveying the weirdness of this time travel story. Yeah. You know, and what that would really be like to experience as a person walking in off the street and suddenly sucked into a Doctor Who story. Right. So it really, that one really worked well for me. I really liked The Girl in the Fireplace as well. These, oh, I love that one. These yeah, ones won Hugo's, you know, they, they for, for best dramatic presentation right. in science fiction, you know, in television. And I, I'm a huge fan of Donna Noble. She was like, Donna she, Noble. She is my favorite companion of all companions, old and right. new. I she really liked good. her. And yeah. she was so funny. She was hilarious. And yeah. she's, I think, the only companion, male or female, that wasn't, like, into the Doctor. Yeah. Like, or was genuinely a, a, just a friend to him. And a, com, who there, was genuinely there, was not a, there was not, like, a sexual tension going right. on. Right. They, no, right. they weren't doing any of that. They were just sidekicks and companions. And it was great to see that on the screen. And she that wasn't was portrayed in a cheesecake way, really. Right. No, yeah. no. So I loved her. So I thought that was really good. And these are all Matt Smith. Um, I I also liked um, the first guy. What, the first guy in the reboot. I forget his name every time. Um, tall. Christ- Christopher Eccleston. Eccleston. I really. I, I love him. And you know, I know why. I know why he left. I understand. <laughs> I don't think they. Yeah. I don't think they did a good job with him. They I don't think they used him well. They didn't I, use him I well. I really loved him, and I was disappointed that he was only there for a year yeah 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 now i i feel like uh he really did his best but he got some scripts and some direction that didn't really make this good use work. of him yeah. and you know where he, but the, but he had some memorable episodes too the um the kids with the gas masks that whole th- oh, bit that what, creepy. That gen- yeah, and genuinely that's creepy we got uh, Jack, what's his name? Jack Harkness. Jack Harkness. Captain Jack. A, Jack st- Harkness a hilarious character. Torchwood, yeah. Uh, yeah, Torchwood came from that episode. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, it mm-hmm. did. See, and, okay. So, have you seen Torchwood? I have not seen Torchwood. We haven't seen Torchwood. I love Torchwood. Love, love, it's love not, Torchwood. I've watched all of that. It's a little more adult. Um, and yeah. so, we didn't ever think we could really show the DVDs to our kids. Yeah. So, so what? What, do we, what would you say? Kid friendly, not kid friendly. Um, in the house with them, or too, keep it out of the like, building with the children, too, or what? too much erotica kind of situation. Like, what, what, what no, do you say? no. I always, I thought, well, there's no erotica in it. I mean, he's he's unisex, as you know. So, um, well, p- panse- pansexual, pan- pansexual, or. Yeah. yeah, yeah. His character is pansexual. So, um, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I I think that 
you know, over eight is probably fine. Okay. Well, you know, maybe we'll get it, give it a try. Give maybe it a I'll shot. Get a what season happens. one DVD. We'll see how Torchwood goes. Because yeah, I'm I'm very curious about Torchwood, and they yeah. keep referencing it. Yeah. You know, um, and let's see here. Um, I I I know that you're a sci-fi fan, um, and you talked a little bit. Um, how do you feel Doctor Who intersects with your sci-fi um, fandom, Jules? Because I, I think there's a way in which you might not really see Doctor Who as sci-fi. It's a little more fantasy and time travel and a little less like hard science fiction. It's, it's soft, soft uh, science right. fiction. Right. Yeah. So, so how do you, like, how would you describe yourself as a sci-fi fan? And yeah. how do you feel Doctor Who fits into that? Yeah, like with with you're also a big Star Trek a fan, big Trek, yeah. right? And that's a little tends to be a little harder science fiction. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I always considered it part of the science fiction science fiction genre. I mean, he is an alien. Yeah, it's okay. only when we get to um, I I can't remember names, but um, when they did the Doctor Who movie is when he said that he was half human on his mother's side. Oh, oh, that was Paul McGann. He only did that movie. Right. Oh, that that was like in the, was that the late 80s, early 90s? 90, 96. It was 96. Yes. That was like a reboot that didn't get off the ground. And when he was that, like in the United States? They were trying to yeah. reboot it. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. And it, so that was kind of like, yeah, we did in watch, the Bible. We did watch that. I, I remember that now, like he was in yeah. San Francisco or something. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. not entirely clear if you should take that all as part of the canon (laughs) right right yeah yeah so um but yeah i mean it to me it totally fits in i i was totally into star trek too especially my Mm -hmm. college years because they would show it on one of the channels i could get from like 11 to 12 at night and every single night my friends and i Mm -hmm. would watch the original star trek it sounds to me what you're describing with all the fun you can have like watching these shows with people it's kind of like the experience to for me of, you know, if you sit down by yourself and put on the Rocky Horror Picture Show and try to analyze it as a as a film, <laughs> you're going to be scratching your head and going, this is terrible. What right? am I even looking at, right? But if you sit down, if you go to a, a you know, a live screening with all your friends in costume and whatnot, you know, it's it's totally different hilarious experience. and it's a totally different experience. It's a social experience. Right. And that sort of helps you know, redeem the fact that maybe this show, this thing is kind of dorky, you right, know, is right. slow. In but, parts. but I think uh, this is the, uh, um, is, is it okay if people know like your field? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so Julie is, is a, uh, a pharmacological researcher, yeah. which is, you know, it's a nerdy field. It's a nerdy field. Right. I mean, you, you need a lot of nerd cred to get in, you know what I'm yes. saying? Um, and, um, so or geek, it, geek cred. It makes sense that you, the, your friends right. would be would be nerds. We'd be also, you know, yes. geeky enough to enjoy science fiction, and it's kind of like the social environment for geeky people. Yes, right. Yeah. It's, it's it's sci-fi, and I yeah. think um, that's an element that we've not really talked about very much. No, we've only talked we've only talked about it like sort of as like film critics. <laughs> science fiction for me as a teenager was a social thing. Right. I went to a con called Disclave in '84, '83. Mm-hmm. I can't, '80. I can't even remember honestly. Right. I was like, I was like, uh, no, it was '86. I was like, um, uh, 19, okay. I think. Okay. And that was my first con. That was in the DC area, right. and and then my friend Art, you know, he was another big science fiction fan, and we had. I wrote for this fanzine called Tapadance, and that was a social thing. Social thing. Right. For, for people who, you know. Who were, you know, nerds. nerds <laughs> and, uh, I mean, you're, you're preferred you preferred. I don't care. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay. Some people take offense to being called a nerd I, and I insist on being have. called a geek. I'm like, well, you know, I can't claim that I'm not a nerd. Jeez. <laughs> you know. I, I can't, yeah. All right. Well, well I, actually, I, I should probably out myself that I, I never went to cons or anything like that because I, yeah. you know. Um, you were doing activism and stuff. I was doing and, activism uh, and stuff, and I was uh, um, more in the student athlete crowd. Yeah, right. Well, it's just like in college, I hang out. I I, I hung out with um, people who were uh, in the LGBT community. Mm-hmm. 
I'm not gay or transgendered or any any of those things. I just I found an affinity for the right. people who were kind of on the fringes of culture in various oh, ways. Definitely, and we Obs- yeah 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 we we found our home in the commuters lounge, which was yeah. always a random mix, right? Of very unusual people. I, th- I felt <laughs> yeah right, and those the people who are maybe not your mainstream, you know, st- student athlete, you know, right. Uh, kind of person i always find those people to be much more interesting and much better interesting. better friends yes. and all you know well that that was always true for me those were the people that i found to really be my friends yeah that were like you know on my team cheering for me right thinking the best of me and inviting me yes so yeah yeah so yeah that's i think science fiction fandom and fantasy fandom you know did that for a lot of people yeah and it was a, a, a huge uh, a social space to engage right and to uh, have have shared meaning yeah yeah so you you got do you have any more questions because i have sort of a lightning thing okay yeah okay i want to mention i want to mention these fan edits and the i the problem that i can't figure out who my favorite doctor is (laughs) oh which is serious it's a serious problem it's an idea it's actually a form of identity crisis oh right (laughs) so I'm, uh, i'm i'm not completely feigning interest okay so, Jules, have you seen very many of the Hartnell, the first Doctor shows? Yeah, I've seen some. Um, probably, I mean, Tom Baker is my favorite. Yeah. And then it's probably David Tennant. But another one of my favorites is John Pertwee, who was the third Doctor. Okay, yeah. Because um, oh, yeah, yeah. they used to, before they rebooted it, they mm-hmm. would show, they wouldn't show, I don't think I ever saw the first doctor like on television on pbs yes the second one the bbc threw out a lot of his episodes yeah I think. a lot is a lot is missing so a lot half. is lost and the stuff that's there they only have stills and they've like tried to you know copy in the the pieces the, yeah they have audio they some of them are released with with stills and some of them have been reconstructed using animation yeah. But I, I have seen mostly all of the first Doctor. Okay. Mm-hmm. I, I think he's different. He's um, less human. He has less humanity. Okay, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. He does you seem know. he does seem kind of kind of mean spirited in a way toward, yeah, almost, towards yeah. the humans. Yeah, yeah. towards his companions. Yeah, and I remember vividly the first episode. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. When they uh, brought fire to the cavemen, wondering whether or not <laughs> oh, they should have done that. Is that a good idea? I don't know. Yeah, what that, do you think? Like, you watch the the first Doctor, and you're like, "Is that a zipper in the suit?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, oh, yeah. they're they're pretty cheesy, cheesy. Yeah. Um. So I just want to run through. Um. So I I want to mention a couple that we've been watching recently because I'm excited about them. Um. We've been digging into the the second Doctor years. Mm-hmm. And uh, like like we said, a lot of the episodes were junked, like almost half, I think, uh, yeah. of the second Doctor's episodes, which means that almost all of the serials, the stories, mm-hmm. are incomplete, are lacking right. episodes. And they've been reconstructed in various ways. Some of them you can get in audio form. Mm-hmm. Some of them you can get with... Um, they're called telesnaps, or, you know, with these uh, still pictures oh, so with audio. Yeah. But a number right. of them now have been animated to fill in the gaps. These are the fan oh, really? edits. Wow. No, the no, they aren't the fan edits. The the because oh. it's expensive to do animation. So they have these shows that where they've released where the audio continues and you just switch to animation when there's a missing episode. Oh, is that what we've been watching? Or? That's what we've been watching. But what oh. we've been watching in particular is there's a Doctor Who fan edit page, and I mentioned it in my blog, and I've linked to it from the show notes of previous podcasts, where uh, hardcore fans who are into video editing take the released uh, DVD material, right. and where you might have a, a six-part story right. or an eight-part story, twenty, you know, like... Uh, eight 25-minute episodes. That's four so, hours. yeah. Um, and they'll cut it down. They'll they'll ruthlessly like edit it way down, like to an hour and a half, or even less. And right. and they'll basically take out all the screaming the, all the running through corridors, all the redundant stuff, 
all the extra overlapping like cliffhanger scenes Mm -hmm. and they'll turn it into one smooth uh or sometimes two parts but one smooth Mm -hmm. dramatic piece and we've watched two recently where the fan editor really did something more creative so there's a there's a second doctor story called the enemy of the world which Mm -hmm. was um there was only one episode surviving out of the six part uh series but then a few years ago I think from like a storage room in a television station in Nigeria, I think it was, <laughs> the BBC had uh, copies returned of, right. of the oh missing God. episodes. So we're, we're watching a show that aired in um, 67, 68, mm-hmm. um, and it has, is just now, like just a few, I think it was 2013, mm-hmm. just now been restored and released to the public. But the the you know but the real difficulty is so it's a fascinating story. Yep, it's kind of amazing, but it still has that Doctor Who pacing where it's very slow to watch the whole four hours. It's very sluggish to watch the the whole four hours, and it right. really makes it kind of painful. But so a fan, one of the fan editors, took the Enemy of the World and turned it, I kid you not, into a James Bond movie. Yeah, <laughs> they made it with music. They made it widescreen. Yep. They animated a whole separate opening sequence that is just a perfect takeoff of the James Bond movie opening sequences. Right, and then throughout it, they're using music cues from across the spectrum of of Bond, Bond films. films. Right, which completely changes the dramatic pacing of the the film. Yeah, yeah, and turns it into a much more, I don't know. You got this sort of like tension rising in your chest when you're watching and you know they're it, about to get caught. It actually is exciting in right. a way that the original serials tend to, like they build a little excitement, but then it's ended to go on to the next, the next show. The next show. So you're saving right. that excitement for the next show. So, and then you kind of get spent on it. Yeah. Right. But so this one, it this is a strange story where Troughton plays two characters. He plays the doctor mm-hmm. and he also plays... This Mexican strongman, super Latin genius. Latin American. We don't know if he's Mexican or not. No, but he's like, Mexican. Specifically oh, Mexican oh, I, from I, I the Yucatan Peninsula. Got it. Yeah. And his name is Salamander. His name is Salamander. Salamander. And so Troton is basically playing it in brown face, you know, and yeah. he's and he's doing this kind of atrocious Mexican <laughs> accent. Yes. But it gets really weird because, of course, the plot involves him having to impersonate Salamander. Right. So it cuts into these scenes and you're like, okay, wait, who am I watching now? Is it the doctor or is yeah. it Salamander? And so he does have these scenes where he fools people pretending to be Salamander when he's really the doctor. Mm-hmm. And then later at the end, uh, they have scenes where he's fighting Salamander, right? He's, bo- he's in there twice. twice right. And then uh, he winds up going into the TARDIS and he fools the companions. Salam- it's, it's actually Sal- Salamander, Salamander. And they think he's the doctor. doctor. So it's quite confusing. But it, like in the good way? But in a good way. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think the fan, that fan edit is wonderful. The fan edit is wonderful. They really wonderful. have raised really it up to, to be the kids are breaking up the furniture upstairs if you're banging that's yeah it's all it's fine it's, it's fine. fine it's fine there's everything's good i'm sure it's safe um but that fan it is really fun and worth watching and i would highly recommend it there's another one we just watched um you didn't watch it you were oh yeah i was doing a thing you were doing a thing but it's called the moon base and it's the second cyberman story um with Troton again, mm-hmm. and it takes place on the moon. And because it takes place on the moon and is set in this moon base, and they're going outside the base sometimes, they, the fan editor turned it into an episode of Space 1999. Oh my God. I used to watch that show. I loved that show. I loved that show too. And you know, you remember how stylized, like the. The opening oh, yeah. stu- the opening was with all this rapid cutting of these like scenes and it had the waka chicka waka chaka like disco guitar, you know, funk music right. to it. It's just hysterical. So they turn this episode, which is this one is partially animated, so it's mm-hmm. missing a lot, and they turn it so they will just sort of fade smoothly between some of the clips that exist in film form mm-hmm. and the animated form. Right. And 
yeah, there's other, there's another one we watched not long ago, uh, one of the Dalek stories, which I, I mentioned in a previous episode. Oh, it's, is it Charlton's first episode? Is that one, one you're thinking of? Uh, y- yes. Yes. Oh, I, I got to say, Julie, I really recommend the fan edits. The animation, I think, is seamless. Yeah. It's really... That, that's good. a Dalek yeah. story, and mm-hmm. it is really creepy to watch. It's really yeah. scary. Yeah, the, the Daleks are, are scary. Are they on YouTube? There's a there's a fan edit site. I'll, I'll put it in the show in notes. the show notes. It's already in the show notes. But you go to this fan edit page, and it has there are fan edits for every single serial. Oh wow, yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. And, you know, well, it is a labor of love. You know, yeah. and like I said, this is this is a community thing. It's a community effort. It's kind of like what. Grace was talking about, you know, how the science fiction fandom is a community right. building thing. Mm-hmm. But um, they are quasi legal. The BBC tends to turn a blind eye to this kind of thing because they're not idea. selling them. And, it's free revenue. It's free marketing. And it's, yeah, it's, it's marketing, but it's also like it's a derivative work. It's sort of a. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's. Lucas does the same thing. He actually allows. Um, people to put out fan edits and adaptations of Star Wars without right. suing them. At least he did. I don't did. know if, I, does he own it? Can if he... Disney will still honor that yeah. or not. But there are fan edits, say, of, of the Star Wars films that right. do similar things. Mm-hmm. Okay, lightning round. <laughs> Finally. So I just wanted to get... I'm going to go through the doctors. Got it. And uh, if, if you have any comments about those particular doctors yep. what you've seen what you your impression okay mm-hmm. we've already talked about some of them but it's okay hartnell william hartnell old 1963 and 1966 old and mean old and mean jules yeah um that was that and then oh his granddaughter was on it cause yeah she yeah susan, susan foreman yeah. right yeah. so she was apparently the two teachers she yes. was apparently another another time lord we, we never get back into that she was a Oh, yeah. If that's his granddaughter, right? Yeah, what happened? To, uh, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Patrick Troughton. I kind of like him. I, I think he's actually one of the better actors. Yes. Yeah. But uh, did he lose the hat? Because I think the hat... Yes, he lost the hat. So in the very first few episodes, he's doing this thing with like, like his Scottish getup, and he has this floppy hat, and he's playing right. the he's playing the recorder all the time, and it's just yeah. like... Like his character hadn't come into focus. He's just sort of doing these. And I think that Matt Smith is making a joke about that with the fist. Probably. Yeah. Patrick Troughton, Jules, what do you think? Patrick Troughton, I remember him a lot because he was, uh, the doctor was marooned on Earth. Then he was working with Unit. Yes. He was, um, the doctor himself was very serious. The actor who played him was more of a comedic actor. Yes. Yeah. And okay. I think that there's some times that came through yeah, yeah i like john pertree a lot um he's probably one of my most favorite doctors mm. okay i'm gonna actually say that having seen like less than half of his of of troton's actual mm-hmm. second doctor's actual uh shows mm-hmm. i think he's my favorite actually really? yeah and partly because partly because the shows they were clearly doing like experimental stuff Mm-hmm. They were experimenting with like for a while some of the shows like the the Cybermen Invasion shows. He was like a super spy. He was like kind of supposed to be a bit of an Austin Powers character. Yeah. And the companions were like supermodels, and so they'd show up and immediately start doing little fashion shoots of each other, you know, with yeah. feather boas and all this. And that these places were like the British culture of the time sort of seeps into the show. Mm-hmm. I just love that stuff. I, it's just hilarious to me. Yeah. So I don't know. I think um, Troton, where especially the the super spy version of the Doctor, where he's gets to be more of an action hero. Yeah. You know, and that's an enemy of the world too. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think that's making him my favorite. It's really a shame, a deep shame that so much of that material is lost. But I am really pleased that they are getting shows back and they are reconstructing them and the animations are terrific. And Mm -hmm. I think, you know, he sadly is deceased, but I think he would really appreciate, actually, even the fan edits, I think he would really appreciate appreciate that people were having fun with his 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 work, work, you Mm -hmm. know. 
next. So we did. We talked about Pertwee. Yep. Pertwee's a little different because he... He's the sword guy, isn't he? He's like he, he knows kung fu. Yeah. You know, he drives this uh, this fliver, this like, um, what's Oh, the... I love his car. Uh, yes. And they kind of like lost the TARDIS for a while, right? He was, yeah, uh, he was stranded on Earth. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So the, yeah. Time, the Time Lord stranded him, said he can't, he doesn't get to use the TARDIS. So he has to have all these like land bound, adve- bound adventures. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he was the first doctor in color too. So mm-hmm. that makes maybe a little more relatable to yeah. modern. Okay, Tom Baker then. He was doctor for almost seven years. Yeah, a lot of people. He's like, you know, every man's doctor. If you know what yeah, you're saying? he's still my favorite doctor. Yeah. 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 I never quite got the jelly babies. Like, I've tried them. I, I can't get into jelly babies. <laughs> yeah, well, I tried the gummy bears because, you know, he would always be like, have a gummy bear. Yeah. yeah. yeah but I never, you know, never quite not, not, not a fan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Of that. Yeah. No, uh, I, I, used to buy, amazing, I, I used to buy um, Isaac. Jelly Babies, just so he could hand them out to people with his, with, with his scarf. Because he had a scarf yeah. and a trench coat yeah. and Jelly Babies they're in his pocket. They're an import. I mean, they're hard to find here, yeah. but you can get... They're they're like gummy bears. They're a little softer. Right. But, um, yeah. It's, yeah. Good, really. Okay. Now, Peter Davidson. Now we're getting into sort of the more controversial doctors. Peter was Davidson, he, two years, 11 months, and 24 days from... I, I liked him. I did. Was this the blonde you know, guy? Part, yeah. The first part of him was he had lost his memory... Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. but there was this episode they were on a ship. Turlo was in it. Mm-hmm. And part of it was about good and evil and they were talking about well, how can you tell that evil exists? Well, evil is the absence of good. And mm-hmm. if there was no evil, then there would be nothing to compare it to. And mm. that always stuck with me. That's pretty deep for a <laughs> cheesy science fiction <laughs> show, show, right? <laughs> <laughs> See, yeah, I, Davidson had the straight blonde hair, the like the, the like the white cricket outfit, and the and celery, the celery, yeah, celery yeah. Uh, 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 boutonniere. And yeah. did, wasn't his companion the one of the first the, the first companion to actually die? Was that Davidson? Yeah. I think yeah. so. Yeah. Or, or was that the, the uh, that was it, yeah that was Earthshock. Earthshock, where he like goes yeah. back in time. He goes back in time and triggers the extinction, extinction of, of the dinosaurs. dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, right? right. That's a pretty dramatic. Uh, episode, yeah, that's a pretty dramatic moment. I liked his companions better than him. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, for, he's yeah. a little a little bland as an actor, maybe, but um, yeah, but, but, yeah. Fun. but the 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 storylines were better, and I liked his companions. I wasn't into him as a doctor. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Okay, next. You know one. that David Tennant is married to his daughter in yes, real life. Yes. That's hilarious. <laughs> and he met the daughter because she was a guest star on one of the episodes oh yeah, 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 yeah. she, yeah. she right. played the doctor's the daughter. daughter and then she became the doctor's right. wife it and really always, is yeah. it really is a time travel story <laughs> right. i swear yeah oh my goodness okay the next one i think is actually the most i didn't really like the next one i don't have many memories of the next one colin, except i didn't really like him colin baker two years eight months he he is Who's um colin baker Colin Baker is the one with curly blonde hair who wore yeah. these outrageously colored patchwork, almost like a coat of many colors no, kind of no. thing. No, no. See, he was just riffing on the Joker. I never liked that. I, it's like it wasn't his, even he, his own story. He was doing a character. He was playing the doctor as a guy who had actually kind of gone psychotic. Like, Yeah, yeah. No, I, that's what, what I mean. I think, I think he didn't have... He didn't good really, direction? He, well, not even good direction. Like... It's almost like they forgot what the Doctor Who story was about. Yeah. And they started yeah. telling the Joker's story. Something like that. So I, I just never, I don't know. I, I never got with he's, it. He's widely, uh, and widely again, reviled. I'm not, uh, yeah, widely reviled. I'm not sure you can really blame the actor per se for right. a lot of this stuff. I mean, right. I don't think no, he don't, picked don't think out his fair. outfit, you know. No, no. But, it was a casting issue or something. But yeah, he's widely considered to be like the, the one of the weakest uh, doctors and his mm-hmm. stories are not considered to be really great but and, and just to be clear about my opinion i think that's that's an issue because of uh the, you know the producers and the directors lost the production the direct- and they the lost writing. the direction they right. lost okay sylvester mccoy wait i didn't hear what oh i did hear what julie thought she didn't like oh it, i'm right? sorry yeah did you have anything else to say about uh, about colin baker jules no 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 Good there's not really much else to say and, <laughs> and and doctor, i think i've maybe seen one or two episodes for some reason they didn't 
show them on PBS. All right. Now, who, who's the next one? Sylvester McCoy. Oh, McCoy. Yeah. I liked McCoy. I He's a little weird. He's actually my... Like in, a, in a good way. He, he is up there with my favorite doctors because I like the actor. And I mm. think he's very funny. Mm-hmm. And he does, like, he'll turn a scene into a comic scene... Mm-hmm. And he'll sort of jump back and forth between drama and comedy really Effortlessly. fluidly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But he but his stories mostly were not very good. Stories kinda sucked. It's yeah. True. It's true. Uh, now he no, and he's like he's also a good actor. I've I, seen him in other He's effects. also, I think, a pretty good actor. Well, he's now playing Radagast in the Hobbit not well, now, now but, but but he he played Radagast in the Hobbit trilogy. Mm-hmm. He was really good in in the Hobbit. He was really yeah. good in the Hobbit. I I really enjoyed his character. I can't say I really thought the whole Hobbit trilogy was great, but he was good in it. He yes. was one of the best things about it. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. These are Roscobel <laughs> rabbits. <laughs> Yeah, for a man walking around with bird crap all over his head, he was very good. <laughs> a very self-deprecating role, obviously. Yeah. So he clearly doesn't take himself that seriously as an actor, which I think is the best way to really absolutely to yeah. just take it. Right, Paul McGann. Who is Paul McGann? Paul McGann. I, I remember there was such a buildup because I was in grad school and uh-huh. I had another friend who was really into Doctor Who, and they had such a buildup to to this and we were all anticipating what's it going to be like Nine, this was a 96 reboot the single yeah, movie. and when right. it came out because i saw it on, on tv mm-hmm. when it came out it, it was kind of deflating yeah oh. they and it was then, it was very like trendy in, in the way it was shot it was like a music video in a way it was mm-hmm. kind of like yeah. do you remember highlander the yeah. movie. Yeah. It was almost of a style like Highlander or something like mm-hmm. that. And then uh, Sylvester McCoy, they interviewed him about that. And he said, you know, he didn't really think it was necessary to have him in it. Mm-hmm. It didn't right. add to the story. Mm-hmm. But they paid him so much money that he wasn't <laughs> going to complain about it. Right. Yeah. Oh, but mind you, I think his, I think the parts that had Sylvester McCoy were the best parts of that movie. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. like the the opening sequence where they bring where he's there and he's uh, they show him uh, regenerating, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Those are the best parts of the movie, I thought. Yeah, and I could yeah. actually really get what was happening and get the story, you know. Whereas I feel like somehow the story that they wanted to tell wasn't actually a Doctor Who story. Yes, and the only person doing a Doctor Who story was that opening section with McCoy. Right, right. So, no, it was like a, it was like a. Uh, like an episode of Miami Vice or some kind of crime drama yeah. or something. It just and then the companion was actually a woman. I think it was half British, half American, but she played it with an American accent, mm-hmm. which yeah. I found kind of <laughs> sacrilegious. <laughs> how can weird. how can the doctor not be British? British. You know That's how not... come he's not British? How yeah. come uh, you I... know all the villains don't have British accents because right, they right. had. Roberts played the master. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm always glad. To, I'm always glad for uh, a Doctor Who with the master in it, though. Yeah, we look forward to the master, and we really enjoyed um, Missy, especially in the rebooted she series. Was so she great. was so great. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect psychopathic character. Yeah. Marvelous. <laughs> All right. So we've been through Eccleston and Tennant. We've been through Smith and Capaldi a little bit. Um, what What do you think um, is you're looking forward to are you planning to watch jody whitaker's doctor I, I would i think so because i would love to see the doctor as a female trying to figure out life as a female yeah um looking down and figuring out my god i have you know boobs and a vagina what do i do, <laughs> do, I do now you know i just i i just can't wait to see the comedy around it and i think she's a really good actress i've actually oh, seen she her in a lot of stuff. Okay, I, I don't really know anything about the actress. Yeah, I know this actress. I, yeah, she she was in Broadchurch with David Tennant, and I love Broadchurch. I watched all of that. Okay, I haven't seen Broadchurch. No. I'm I'm um, skeptical, uh, skeptical, reticent. Yeah, just because I thought that Donna Noble was a great female character. Mm-hmm. Um. That's actually the only time I've seen them do a really good female character, other than Missy. Yeah, well, you remember that, that they've also changed showrunners. 
Do they actually have a different showrunner now? Yes. Maybe he's not a flaming misogynist now? Yeah. Is that what you're, you know? That's something that I've debated with a lot of fans. I don't want to get too deep into the woods here. But but, but no, that's, but that's w- my Whether skepticism. Moffat was really just, just oh God, he was, a was a misogynist. Just, 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 uh, just really kind of had a, an antipathy towards strong female characters. Because River Song, I, I, you, you've not seen much of the River Song um, arc. No. Okay. So, um, now, do, wait, do you mind spoilers? Does that ruin it for you? No, you can, that's fine. Because, like, like I said, I I haven't really watched. It okay. After. Yeah. So, River Song is this great, great character. She's um, so she, she's, she's an archaeologist. She's an archaeologist. Also a professional thief. Also a professional thief. Same thing. Really. She's um, I think they're making a joke about that. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, and Time travel. She's uh, Rory and Amy's child that's a big spoiler big spoiler yeah. and the doctor's wife for most of the arc the doctor doesn't realize this is his wife right right okay right. and they don't end her so her arc technically they, begins they, with they, they meet just to, to be clear the doctor meets her repeatedly they're experiencing each other in reverse, in order. reverse order so right. so when he meets her for the first time she's saying goodbye right and, and that's with, with uh, uh david Tennant. yes and then she experienced a whole a whole arc with uh, Matt Smith. Yeah, so she she actually the the relationship between them crosses between his um, like three regenerations, two, right? Between two different regenerations, between three yeah, different doctors. Yeah, and her arc ends um, mostly with Capaldi. With Capaldi, and so she is actually technically a Time Lord. Yeah, ha- like a half time, like half time Lord. She regenerates several times before she. Uh, is uh, present as, as River Song as we know her mm-hmm. as the adult. And she's this very smart, very... Um, Unethical. <laughs> uh, uh, what is it? Uh, flexible, eth- flexible, flexible ethics. Flexible ethics. Because I think she has strong ethics. I just think... She's, she's very, very loyal to him. Right. Absolutely. And um, loves him unfailingly. And this is where we cross the line to just being perverse. Yes. Like she has this... Um, like she's clearly crazy, and she has this bizarre sort of misplaced uh, loyalty to the doctor that goes beyond just sort of like hero worship, and it's yeah, it, um, it gets uncomfortable to watch. We we love this character, but then we see her turned into like not like um yeah, like you say, hero worship, like, like a le- bizarre worshipful of him rather than you know seeing him as an equal. Right, right. And, and it just felt like it didn't need to be that way. It didn't need to be that way, it didn't need to be there, because she is, she is brilliant in her own right. Yeah. Brilliant and capable and all these amazing things, and yeah. we see her stuff that, literally stuff that down about herself. And it's, that never needs to happen. It doesn't add to the story, and in fact takes away from the story. Yeah. And I think that's the most explicit um, sort of like destruction uh, mis- of a female character, misogynist. Yeah, it's the most. It's the it. most clear sort of uh, um, revelation, revelation of sort of the misogyny and the and the, the writer, right? Writer. And so I'm a little bit skeptical and a little bit hesitant about the female doctor. I'm like, really? What are they going to do? Yeah. Where in contrast, they have Donald Noble, who is this great, um, strong character in her own right, and they let her be that. Yeah. Right. And then they have Missy, and I think you haven't seen Missy either. Don, Donna Noble's end was beautifully tragic too. Yes. It was terrific. It was. It was so tragic when they had to like, pretty much erase her memory. Yeah. And, and like, she she could happened. not. She could, and if she the idea was if she ever met up with him and remembered all that she'd die like right. her brain would yeah. explode or whatever. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and sort of, sort of like so many of us, like maybe we're. Maybe we're great heroes and we just don't know and remember. We just don't know it because our memories were erased after we saved the universe. After we saved the world, right? That's yeah. what I, I like to think of myself. But. Right. So I, I really felt like that was a very, um, that was I think it was an excellent treatment. Yeah. And then Missy, yeah. who the master, Missy is a female time lord yes. who is um, a regeneration of the master. Of the master, yeah. And she's... Um, She's uh, def. If you haven't seen the Missy episode, she's no. so worth watching. Worth it, totally uh, worth it. Yeah, just for her. Which doctor was she in? She she starts with Matt Smith. Yeah, I believe so. She starts with Matt Smith, and she's um, the master is a psychopath anyway. Right. So it's not necessarily yeah. like they're saying women are psychopaths. So I don't get that from her at all. No, no. She that's that's the funny thing. This character that's a, a huge murderer. 
right, right is not misogynistically portrayed. That's what's so funny right, about it. Right, <laughs> and she's and the master's always been a psychopath. Right? right, and she's strong and she's smart and resourceful, and <clears throat> um, they use her femininity. Yes, to allow you to see the doctors, not the doctors, but the masters. Like that little glimmer that the doctor sees of in the humanity. master, right? Of it all, time lord, oh, t- right? Yeah. The doctor sees this little glimmer of goodness in the master, and you're like, "What are you even looking at?" He he, right? He tries very hard to rehabilitate her. the master, right? And and, but Missy allows you he, to see that because, as the last of the time lords, he would love to have a companion, another time lord right. out there who he could not be in locked in mortal combat, combat with all the right? time. <laughs> so the doctor's got a lot invested in this. Yeah. But Missy is the first time you see, you can see the goodness that the doctor's looking at. Yeah. yeah. And that's, so I thought that was a really great, Right. she was a great character yeah. and she's just fun to watch. Um, and also a great actress. I'm yeah. really impressed with her work as an actress. Um, so because of these, I know it can be good. Yeah, I've seen them do it well Ca- before. Cautiously optimistic. So I'm cautiously optimistic and vaguely interested, but so you're not, many. You're not getting your hopes up. No, I, I, I wasn't impressed with Rose Tyler as a female lead. I wasn't impressed yeah. with Martha Jones as a female lead. Yeah. I wasn't like so many. And Amy Pond, don't even get me started as a female lead. Yeah, I just, I just can't with any of this. <laughs> so, I. I don't want to watch and see like an another, Amy Pond River Song situation. Another shitty character. Yeah, another shitty female character. Just to, I don't know, work out somebody's mother issues. I don't know. Yeah, I what I'm worried about with um with the the, the next um, incarnation is that they're gonna try and make her like a manic pixie dream girl. Yeah, uh, which I think the Doctor is a manic pixie dream girl. Uh, right? Yeah, right. Um, but it's always been a man. Right, but well, it's some of them more than others. But like you know, the way they're portraying her costume as being so goofy, yeah, like put together with scraps and all that. Well, some doctors have been like that, but yeah. they haven't been the better ones. The mm-hmm. the better ones, I mean, like you know, kind of have a theme. They have a theme. They have right. a, like doing I, a thing. They pick a historic period and they said, "I am." Like what a a person called the doctor would have dressed like in Victorian the London doctor. and some this, other era, that, you know. Yeah. Right. Well, you know. Right. Well, so so I am interested. Yes. And like like Julie said, there's a lot of comedy gold here yes. waiting to happen. Yeah. And I I'd like to see that happen. Let's find out if she's a ginger, if the if the uh, curtains match the rug. <laughs> <laughs> That would be great. That would be but, a fun, that could be a funny gag. But yeah, so finally, I, Ginger she finally looks ginger. down into her pants. You yeah, know. <laughs> Ginger. <laughs> oh goodness. Uh, so yeah, all, right. all kind of opportunities exist, and I and I would be there for that. Yeah. But um, but I'm just a little reticent. I'm a little skeptical. Yeah, the kids. Okay, so uh, I think we're going to wind up this topic. But the kids have actually we've shown them a bunch of these fan edits, and now they're actually coming to me when I come home and say, "Hey, Dad, can we watch another Doctor, Doctor Who, Who fan edit?" Doctor Who, Doctor Who. Yeah. And we've had the the pinnacle Doctor Who experience. Yeah. One of our children was watching an episode from behind the furniture. Yeah, the when the when the um, Cybermen show up, the Mondasian Cybermen show up in. Um, oh, what's it? What? Was they Mondasian? Yeah, they were the old school old Cybermen. School, yeah. Well, in, in invasion. Yeah, yeah, it was from the Troughton era. It was the invasion yeah. Cybermen. Benjamin was actually hiding behind a chair. And like peeking out. Come, <laughs> like he, could, he couldn't resist watching, but he was terrified and had to hide behind and the that, furniture. That's like the experience of every yeah. British school kid of a certain age growing yeah. up. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on, Jules. This was really good. Yeah, glad, really glad you could join us. Oh, well, thanks for having me. Okay. Take care. Have a great rest of your day. All right. You too. Bye-bye. 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 Okay. Are we... We're on again. I'm here. Okay. Get... Uh, oh, I'm going to need my headphones. Oh, hold you're on. You're going to need your headphones. You're going to be lined up with the, the, be lined up with the mic. Because right. I'm also going to insert Joshua's book report. Oh, that's right. So this is, there's lots of little goodies here this week. Yeah. This week is chock full of stuff. Chock full of stuff. So are we jumping right in? From deep in the wilds of Pittsfield Township, Michigan, it's the Grace and Paul Potts cast. She's a left-wing conservative Catholic homeschooler who loves to garden. He's a bearded computer geek who reads and writes like he's running out of time. 
Together, they're raising an ever-growing army of adorkable children and planning the revolution. It's the Grace and Paul Potscast. Yeah. <laughs> supposed to grow. Baby. Baby. <laughs> Oh, I thought that was just. Oh, okay, yeah. I, I need to turn that into a thing. Like, that I need to. Be a great thing, I yeah. keep wanting to get some time to add sound effects and like music and all that, and I, yeah. I'd love to work on that. Doing it upright would take me like a whole day. Okay. So yeah, just, need our investment. I just don't have it anyway. Yeah. Okay, hi folks. Hey, it's us. <laughs> so, um, this is uh, this podcast is going to be overstuffed with goodies. Yeah. So I actually Little gems and nuggets all over the place. I interviewed Joshua, yep, my nine-year-old son, mm-hmm. and he has a book report for us. Yes. So we will uh, will insert that, mm-hmm. and then we just had a Google Hangout call. Yeah. With uh, our friend Jules. Yep. Julie. Yeah, I call her Jules. You, you, you I've I've Jules. started calling her Jules too. Yeah. Um, uh, our friend Julie Sear, who uh, talked to us about Doctor Who, at length. It, it was good. I thought it was a good, good chat. It was good. So, um, news. We didn't have a walk. Yeah, keeps happening. We've just uh, had a slog. Yep. Another week. <laughs> another week. Slog through another week. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have any books or reading or you'd like to mention? Other oh, I, got than the, the, I finally got The Minimalist Gardener. It came out in uh, November of 2017. So you had pre-ordered this. Like in 2016. Right? And then somehow, somewhere along the way, after between pre-ordering it and it shipping, um, we changed banks, our bank changed names, and the old credit yeah. card numbers expired and all that. Right. And so they couldn't ship it to you they couldn't charge you for it right right and they, they sent me notes I, I missed it i'm notorious about missing my email so I, it's not, yeah it's not but personal. they said you got another one i got it i got it well i got one at all yeah. and um and it's good it's it's basically a an overview of permaculture gardening and puts it in the context of uh, or in terms i think a lot of gardeners are ready to talk about uh being no dig low work Lots Low, of, yeah, like a. Is this for a, a more urban setting? He describes um, urban settings particularly, yeah. but he is specifically talking about um, how you can scale it to any setting. That that this is appropriate and good for any setting. So um, there, there's. He talks about like a common ordinary garden that might be very small, and maybe maybe even on a just on a balcony, right? Mm-hmm. And how you can scale these ideas. Um, to work just even in very small settings. So okay. um, I think there's a lot in it for lots of people. And cool. I think a lot of uh, gardeners and farmers and agriculturalists yeah. are like, oh, that permaculture. <laughs> it's so complicated. Oh, and stupid. You know, it's, just, it doesn't, yeah. That doesn't even make sense. So really, well, you're not going to like dig in compost? Is that really? No, he, he lays out a case for it. He lays out a case for it and talks about really for the terms that I think a lot of, gard- especially aging gardeners, are like, so there's no digging. That would be nice. Tell me more about the no digging. Yeah, right. Um, and there's lower inputs, lower costs. Yeah. Uh, so that's, he, he makes a good case, I think. Cool. And uh, it's called The Minimalist Gardener. And uh, Patrick Whitefield, I believe, is the author. Okay, cool. Um, we'll put a link in we'll the notes. We'll put a link, yeah. It's, it's a good good piece of work. Yeah, so, so I mean, we're here in, the, in this place now in our new home, and we actually do have some space for a garden, mm-hmm. but that doesn't mean we're ready to, like, put in a, a huge... Like, we want to put in raised beds, culture beds. We want to, yeah. you know, do all kinds of stuff. But we might have to do it gradually, gradually as, yeah. like, as, you know, funds permit. So. Finances and effort and permits. And effort, yeah, right. so, so minimalism is actually high on my priority list for a garden yeah. project. Yeah. That I, I, just, I just don't have a lot to put into it. Okay. Yeah. I want to mention a couple books um, pretty briefly. I've been reading The Queen of Air and Darkness, and that's actually... Uh, the second novel within the collection, The Once and Future King, uh, mm-hmm. Omnibus by T.H. Uh, White. Yeah. And so this is, again, part of the King Arthur story arc. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting. It gets The story gets pretty dark, and it's all about like the tragedy of Lancelot in many ways. So, mm-hmm. so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's good. Um, we have watched a handful of, uh, well, wait, let me get, I forgot one. Uh, I started reading to you a novel called oh, yeah. We Have Always Lived in, in the, the Castle. castle. 
by Shirley Jackson. Yeah, that's no, pretty good. And it's getting all right. It, it, you you impressed. weren't impressed by the first chapter, but the second chapter picked up a bit. And you're realizing, as I am, that her writing is actually really, really tight, like mm-hmm. tightly edited. You know, every every uh, word contributes. You know, to building a mood, setting a scene developing a character i'm slowly getting one over to that yeah yeah okay yeah. I, I found her first chapter to be uh to drag and the famous yeah. one the famous short story i thought that would drag a little for me too i you were wondering who she was and i said oh you must have read the lottery no. because it seems like every high school student has to read the lottery no, it wasn't but, a sign i didn't read it but yeah so you went and read it yep available online all over the place yeah Yeah. you can get it easy Uh, anyway but and you thought that was over the top well no i didn't actually i thought it was a good story yeah i thought it was a bit slow okay yeah all right well she's uh she's a contemporary um gothic writer 20 20 mid 20th century gothic writer Mm -hmm. um and her one of this is one of her most famous novels um she also is practically like her uh what's the novel called I, uh, yeah I, i'm well prepared folks she did a novel about a haunted that's, that's a haunted house story oh okay yeah and it you might call it like the first modern psychological haunted house horror novel oh okay where and um just about every contemporary horror author out there from was Stephen King to Neil Gaiman and whatnot was inspired by that book. Yeah. Yeah. And cites it as this is, this is where the it book started. I read that's like, ooh, changes I have to everything. do this. This yeah. changes everything. Changes this how you can tell a, like horror in a modern style. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So three Doctor Who fan edits. Yeah. The, I, I've, I've enjoyed them. Yeah. You've enjoyed them. The invasion, um, the fan edit is called the Cyber uh, Invasion of the Cyberman. This is a um, tenth. Uh, this is from 1968. Okay. Right. This is the second Doctor Patrick Troughton. Mm-hmm. That's a two-parter, mm-hmm. and it's has this like we we talked a bit about it. How he has sort of an Austin Powers feel. Oh yeah, yeah. Like uh, uh, yes, yes. Oh, this is like the first one where Lethbridge Stewart is. Yes, sp- yes. Yeah, okay, yeah, yep. yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's not the first Cyberman story. But yeah. So uh, we, I think, last time we'd watched the first half of that. We've seen the second half of it and how it finishes, and you know, they made the Doctor into more of an action hero, and mm-hmm. the fan edit makes it a lot tighter. Right. Still has these. It kind of amps up the energy of him being an an action hero. Amps up the energy. It still has a lot of um, slow parts. Kind of slow parts and kind of like, I don't know. The effects are pretty good for 1967. I thought so. I thought so. Yeah. So or 1968. Then we went back and we watched uh, the Tenth Planet. Mm -hmm. The Tenth Planet is a First Doctor story. Yeah. And, and isn't that the isn't that the first Cyberman story? That's the first Cyberman story. Right. It's and and the last first Doctor story because he regenerates at, at the, the end. end of this one. Yes. Yeah, and it's partly this one's partly animated. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the last first Doctor story and the first Cyberman story is the same story. Tenth Planet. Yeah. yeah. And the fan edit again makes it much more interesting to watch, much mm-hmm. tighter. Mm-hmm. And then we saw uh, a couple more. We saw The Enemy of the World, yeah. 1967 to 1968. Uh, that is a, a Patrick Troughton story that was partially lost, like all mm-hmm. but one episode were lost for many years and recovered only recently. Yeah. Um, and the fan edit of that is turned into a James Bond-style mo- movie. Yeah. And it's really... it's. It's and a, if you like it's Bond a good at effort. all, if you like Bond, yeah, at it's all. really funny. It's right. very weird, mm-hmm. um, and I'm not going to talk at length about these because we talk more. We talk more about these with our friend Jules, but then we watched another one called The Moon Base, mm-hmm. which is the second Cyberman story mm-hmm. set on the moon, and which the fan edit turns into an episode of Space 1999. Yes, and I am a a fan of Space nineteen ninety nine and that cheesy. Can't, can't I ever watched it? Yeah, yeah. I I I enjoyed it more than I enjoyed old Doctor Who. Oh, of okay. course, it was still cheesy and slow, right. and had lots of issues. 
uh-huh. you know, and credibility <laughs> and, <laughs> and sets and monsters and all. all. It's a beater, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but but I did enjoy it more than the first the old the old Doctor Who that I watched at, back at the in time, the day. At the time, yeah. 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 Then you know how these have held up. That's that's a that's controversial a thing. Okay. Right. So we have two um, main topics today. Yeah. Which I don't know may may seem less like main topics after all. It's all put together. But no, a couple things we wanted to talk about this week. I wanted to talk about this. Um, you and I had an interaction where I was reading about uh, Ivanka Trump's comments. Yes. And Ivanka Trump is 45's daughter, mm-hmm. not his wife. <laughs> yeah, that's his daughter. And uh, you, you said something that... Um, you disagreed that with. I disagreed with. And I was I was actually mad, and but you won me over. So let me set the... Um, let me set the context. Right. So I asked by NBC News, this is from CNN, mm-hmm. if she believes the accusers, Ivanka Trump replied... I think it's a pretty inappropriate question to ask a daughter if she believes the accusers of her father when he's affirmatively stated that there's no truth to it. I don't think that's a question you would ask many other daughters. Right. Now, I just should point out that she's she is his daughter. Right. But she also has the position of senior White House advisor. Yep. Right. Like this is her formal position in the White House. Right. And my comment was, Something like, wow, she does not know what the hell she's doing in this role. Yeah, yeah. Something like that? Something like that. She doesn't know what the hell she's doing. Words to that effect. She's right. just making herself look like an idiot. Well, and then she went on, I believe my father. I know my father. So I think I have that right as a daughter to believe my father. Um, yeah. And this was uh, Monday, and she was re- after she represented the United States in the Winter Olympics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They, they, uh, NBC gr- grilled her about that. Yeah. Okay. And your comment was? My comment was, you know, I think that she knows exactly what she's doing. She knows exactly what like she's, she's doing. She's not even slightly confused. And unpack that a little bit. <laughs> she's sending a message directly to her base about loyalty and really confirming for them that she is loyal to their father as anyone should be loyal to one's father. Right? rather than um, even accepting a, a dominant liberal narrative. She's not even going to let the frame exist. The frame doesn't exist. Yeah. And she's going to reaffirm the frames that her base already has. So the frame she's not allowing to exist is the frame that says, well, there's an overwhelming number of people accusing Trump of sexual misconduct, and he's on tape. That doesn't exist. That frame You know, he's paid, he paid off a porn star. He's on tape um, with the grab him by the pussy comments. Doesn't the Hollywood exist. Movie. Doesn't exist. All doesn't fake exist. news, basically. All fake news. And so your point was, yeah, that, yeah, that she... And, that she She's speaking directly to people who aren't me. Yeah, they're not, she's not talking to you. And to she's, them, she looks great. To them, she looks great. And to them, she's affirmed her loyalty to her father, to a parent. Yeah. And um, the proof of his innocence is his success. That's a weird thing that I have a hard time wrapping my mind about. Right. Because, um, you know, does, does like, you know, factual truth enter into this anywhere at all? You know, that's a, that's almost an unfair question because you could say the same thing about anyone who has uh, a strong ideological bias about their preferred uh, political figures, mm-hmm. right? That, you know, truth is really kind of beside the point. Like, after all is said and done, well, all that may be true, but my ideological bias says this, right? Okay. Right. So, So people, that's a... That's something that's kind of built into people. So she's just activating that for her base by giving them the lines they need to hear, right? Mm, okay. And she does not mention, she doesn't give any any media time to Clinton. Yes. But she evokes her yes. and evokes him and puts them on the offensive in this response, which again is red meat for her base. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because... The first thing you do, what's the first thing that happened? I said, so I said, so what, what, what she, she has answered the question. She's actually answered the question. 
She's affirmed that he's not guilty. Yes. She's affirmed that she's loyal to him and that loyalty is important, and that's a core value for her base. But this, to me, this is like, and th- this has nothing. More. Th- okay. So. And then I say, so what other issues does she raise? She's talking about, does any, are any other daughters ask this kind of question? She's, there's she's only a, one in, daughter we're talking about. She's invoking the Clintons. Right. There's and, only one daughter. Right. That would be Chelsea Clinton. And immediately in this conversation, I'm like, well, so has Chelsea Clinton been asked this question you go to the tape and you see a picture of chelsea clinton being defensive and mousy and kind of like mealy mouth mealy mouth mouse is the wrong word i'm sorry yeah defensive and mealy mouth in response to this same question of a her. similar question about bill clinton about bill clinton yeah, yeah. right yeah. and um but essentially chelsea clinton gives the same answer as ivanka she does yeah and yeah gives nothing to her base and affirms to uh, Ivanka's base that those people are scum anyway hmm. right yeah. so it, it really it only serves to affirm everything and anything about um, what the the 45's administration is trying to do yeah and so, really so sort to, of like pulls her base further in and then if there's anyone out there that hasn't been converted yet mm-hmm. she's also talking to them too interesting so they might like oh yeah, yeah. yeah. so let me to, think about this a little more closely so to you it was actually very canny it's very canny yeah, it's very insightful yeah. um, uh and quick-witted to be honest to take that moment and turn, turn it, it in, yeah. turn it around to like, me on the spot to me it's like can't you see that this is not your like being really really bad at your job as white house advisor but that doesn't mean anything that doesn't mean anything that doesn't, it doesn't mean, anything. mean anything to her base right whereas conversely Clinton's base looks at Chelsea Clinton's like, wow, that's your answer? Right, right. Right? Because for whatever, because in other words, she gives the same answer as as Ivanka, but to the other base. It's not a full-throated defense. It's not a full-throated defense. It's just, yeah. It's just like, that's right. an unfair question. And, you know, somebody asked, me an, uh, somebody asked me a softball question to end the interview. Right, right. That's basically what happened. Right, so. which is just kind of like, so for her base, it's kind of like, Meh. seriously? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. And then doesn't say anything, doesn't put anyone else on the offensive, whereas uh, Ivanka's response actually puts Democrats on the offensive somehow by asking her about what she thinks about her father. Yeah. yeah. Which, I, honestly, I'd like to see any Democrat take an opportunity like that and then turn score it and score. Points. Yeah. It's like, um, it, it, now that I think about it in these terms, it reminds me a little bit of this moment in the debates when, uh, when 45 actually, um, cut off Jeb Bush's testicles and, and served them to him on a silver platter. <laughs> yeah. It was mortifying. It was mortifying to watch. Where he's like, he was talking about, you know, his mother and Trump immediately spun it around. It's like, well, maybe your mother should be running, well, you know. Just and saying. Just like. <laughs> he turned it into a your mama joke. Just gutted him. Yeah, it was awful. Emotionally. I right. mean, not in terms of, you know, let's look at the, the debating points, no, right? But no. no, but just like in a, in a fisticuffs way, you yes. know. Which is what. The people yeah. who like him, that's that's what they like about him. They don't him. see a debate as a chance to get your... No, that's not what's happening. You're not winning in the marketplace of ideas. That's not you're, what's happening You're here. dominating in the marketplace of personality. Right. Yeah. And, and frankly, um, the, the folks, he, he needed Jeb Bush out of the way and he got him out of the way. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and that's all that needed to happen. Right. Okay. So... From that point forward, from that point forward in the de- in the debates and in the campaign, yeah, Jeb was kind of a laughing stock. Yeah, so it, it, it's a good lesson. I mean, you 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 open my eyes a little bit to like why she's saying things like this, and yeah. it's not incompetent. It's not incompetent, and yeah. I think it's important to recognize. I held until the night of the election. I held a little bit of uh, wow, what a bunch of incompetence in reserve about uh, the the forty fives. Uh, campaign mm-hmm. and just sort of this like huh wow, these people are just whoa what's even going on um but and like i've said in the past i i expected him to win um i actually i expected him to win the popular vote um but when i saw that he won the electoral vote and not the popular vote it was that was a moment for me it was like oh 
Somebody in that campaign is thinking about this. I had some strategy. They had a strategy. Yeah. They thought about it. They came up with a plan, and then they executed it. That's, and that this clearly is planned. happened. Right, that clearly happened. But I also I believe that most of the Trump campaign, including him, mm-hmm. did not expect to win. Oh, it, I think. And this is why there was so much grift going on, is because right. they were the, all his senior campaign advisors were like, "Well, we're going to lose, but hey, this is a great opportunity to make, to, to make some money on this and walk away with a." With a nest egg. Sure. And, you know, since we're going to lose, no one's going to be investigating. Yeah, it's not going to be. Yeah. Yeah. So I I think there's there's some there's an element of that. But I think they were in it to win it nonetheless. So, like, you know, you can. Someone was. Someone was in it to win it. And and I think they were as (laughs) as a group. And you can be in it to win it and understand that this strategy is a long shot. Yeah. (laughs) Right. I suppose. I suppose. Right. But it, it does seem based on their. Like um, real amateurish behavior, you know, in the campaigning. It's just like Don Junior's meetings and all that kind of kind of stuff uh, that happened. That that they weren't. They didn't. They did consider it a bit of a long shot. Sure, so, sure, yeah. Anyway, um, it was kind of amateur hour in some ways, but clearly there was some strategy, was strategy for was going planned. after the electoral votes that they needed. These are the votes. Yeah, this is how we get to two seventy. Whereas they asked the question and answered it. Yeah. Whereas. Clinton's team Assumed. in Brooklyn was also, I mean, they were strategizing, but they were strategizing about where they didn't need to campaign, where they didn't need to put any resources. Right. And her, the, the Democratic Party folks on the ground in Michigan were screaming to Brooklyn saying, hey, we need signs, we need resources, we need All the candidate to show so up. Because I don't think this is a done deal here. And they're like, oh, no, our polls show that there's comfortable margin for error. So rather than actually win Michigan, they were trying to win more popular votes in states they had already secured because they wanted, this was actually documented in leaked memos now, they wanted her popular vote victory to be, not only, you know, did they expect her to win the Electoral College victory, Mm -hmm. but they wanted her popular vote margin to be bigger. So they were putting campaign resources into states that were already secure, just so, like California, just so they would have a few million more in the, in the margin of popular vote. Right. Where, and they were actually losing Pennsylvania, Michigan. Minnesota. The whole time they were yeah. losing it. Right. Yeah. Well, and I think, um, you know, I, I, I don't have a lot of patience for the relitigate the election folks. Yeah. And I only, I only want to have this conversation in the context of uh, learning about what to do in 2018 and going forward. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm not trying um, to relitigate. I'm just talking about you know, but I think it's instructive. We, you can't write these folks off as incompetent, right? You can't. Well, no. First of all, you can't write off Forty Five's uh, campaign or administration as incompetent. Yeah, you can't do that. That's a very dangerous mistake. And number two, I, I think the equally dangerous mistake is to assume competence for the yes, Democrats. I mean, the, they, the adults in the room, all right, the consultants, all, all these the, people who claim the the DLC, the the Triple C, the yeah, the, it, the, they're just. Um, they're grifters too. They're grifters too, and and as far as I can tell, the grift is far more important to them than winning elections. Yeah, it really seems that way. It really seems that way because they're now they have all over the country there are these populist, uh, you know, progressive candidates coming up, just bubbling up and from grassroots Out of the ground, and you know? they're saying, oh, we're not going to support this. We're yeah. not going to do that. They're we're not going to do. That. In fact, we're actually going to openly campaign against them. Yeah, and that's um, that they, they are preparing to lose. So, which, you know, you do what you got to do. And I, I mentioned, like, what do we do going forward um, as someone who is is not and never has been a Democrat? Per se. Right? Per se. Yeah. Um, again, sort of uh, t- tentatively embracing this frame that, well, there are two parties and you got to pick one and you got to, you know, do what you got to do. Um, I, I think... There's there's like a few little notes on the horizon. Number one, I believe the Democrats did not endorse Feinstein for Senate, senator in California. Yeah, that that was that was encouraging in a small and, way. And I think well, it's encouraging in a small way. It's a small move, and I think only the only reason that small move occurred mm-hmm. is because of what we saw in 2016 mm-hmm. from the Democratic base. Mm-hmm. that's the only reason that small move took place right. so if there are going to be any other moves like that from the democratic party they have to be driven from the ground up they have to be driven from the ground up and the base is going to have to defect more yeah 
Yeah. So I, I actually push. To, you're actually going to have to push and push hard, yeah. and you will have to defect even more for them to move it, at all. You're going to push them in a direction that can actually win. You're actually fighting against the Democratic establishment. You're fighting against them completely. Tooth and nail. And, and so, so yes. And I think this is the larger thing. The larger, larger thing. Um, while they were assuming that, okay, this is a safe state, we're going to put our resources here so we can get this wide margin because they've got some imagined strategy for that. Uh-huh. They never really, they actually never really, as far as I can tell, did the math and really came to understood that she is not likely to win. Uh-huh. And <coughs> then came up with a strategy to maybe overcome that. Yeah. So they, yeah. I believe they had no strategy for, they assumed she would win and had no strategy for her to win. Yeah. Because they'd already assumed she would. And so never really did the reflection to understand that this was actually just a stupid idea. Yeah. yeah. So in that same way, um, if there's something Democrats want to do, you know, my advice is with, with what you paid for it. Um, maybe take a moment of reflection and try to figure out if what you're doing is just a stupid idea. <laughs> I know, and, and this is like I mean, I, I do this sometimes. Sometimes I have a stupid idea, yes. and I'm working on it, and then like, by the grace you of realize. God, one of my children, my husband, someone who cares about me, comes to me and says, "Hey, you know, Grace, this is a stupid idea," <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh!" First, I'm like mad, right? Yeah, and then I'm like, yeah. "Oh!" Yeah. No, I was actually stupid. angry at you for arguing with me because I'm like, "What? You're taking Ivanka Trump's side?" And and you weren't really, but you were just saying you're not thinking about this in a in a um, insightful way, it's, right? Right. Yeah. So you know, so I, I do that, and I and I really appreciate the people who give me the the free advice that you know maybe this isn't a very good idea. Mm-hmm. Um, and in, in that vein, I think Kamala Harris is not a stupid idea. I don't think she's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. But I think yeah. she's not a stupid idea. Right. Right. Um, I think that I. She's not as good an idea as. Uh, yeah, Nina some, Turner, right? It's me, Nina Turner. But right. Yeah. But but she's not a stupid idea. Right. And then, um, because I don't think the Democrats can play this more than one more time. So they got Barack Obama through. Yeah. So, for example, <clears throat> I don't think they could win an election with Cory Booker because he can't play it twice. Right, right. But I think they could get Kamala Harris through because you could play that. It's, it seems possible. Right, it seems possible. Um, <clears throat> there are a few good ideas out there, but they're all very grassroots and very local. And that's, again, is basically working the third party game. Yes. Like but, but uh, like as a third party from within the Democratic from, Party? From within the Democratic Party. And that's their only winning strategy. Right. Right. So that's um yeah, that that's so that can happen anywhere you are listening. Yep. See who's got a good game going trying to uh, stage an insurrection from within the Democratic Party on a very local level like at the city, county or state level. And I mean, in really city and county see level. See if you can support those folks. See if you can help those folks out. So cuz there's a lot of that going on. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. And I want to say most of the activity is happening in the Midwest. Yeah. Most of the activity yeah. is happening in places that you would think of as red the states. Rust Belt. The Rust Belt. And all these places that yeah, well, you might not think of. That's where that's really fomenting. Big surprise, but I think this actually maybe leads us into our next topic. <gasps> to a state where you might not think of as an, uh, a hotbed of like... Of um, sort of democratic, democratic op, uh, organizing and yeah, no. and all this, but yeah, tell us about the uh, our next topic. Here. So right now, um, teachers in the state of West Virginia have been on strike for about a week. Uh, this is a wildcat strike. It's not authorized by their union. It is a violation of state law mm-hmm. actually for them to go on strike, really even at all. And we support it full, <laughs> full on. Yes, this is the best news I've heard in so long. It's it's really uh, it's amazingly inspiring. promising. It's amazingly yeah. promising. I, I'm humbled by their work. It's amazing. What yeah, done. yeah, yeah. Well, no, because think about it. I mean, just think about this. We're talking about thousands of teachers. Yeah. yeah. Every school, I believe, every school. Correct me if I'm wrong, but for at least three days, every school in West Virginia was closed. West Virginia is a is, is a deep. Republican, deep red um, state. right to work, anti-union, you know, like state in every right. regard. So to get an illegal strike to happen, yeah, and to go on for a week, people are pretty upset. Yeah, no, people well, are pretty sick and fed up. And, they're fed up, and they've reached their line. The best, the best, the best quote I've heard from any of the teachers 
about this is one of the teachers was like, I'm already losing. I have nothing to lose. Nothing going on strike. I can't lose anymore. I can't lose it. What's going to happen? I already can't afford my health insurance. Right. I can't afford You're going to fire live. me? I have to go get another job that pays more? <sighs> Come on. Mowing lawns. Mowing lawns or you know, whatever. Yeah. Right? Because put, for put many it, of them, doing the, if you do the math, they're making almost nothing. Yeah, put it in perspective for the how much t- the teachers in West Virginia earn. So they are, they're making... Fifteen thousand dollars less than the median in household income. They they are just I think just under forty five thousand dollars a year, mm-hmm. and then a significant portion of that covers their health insurance. They and have big big deductions, huge big, deductions. big payroll deductions for their for their health insurance right. copays. So it it looks more like so instead of so instead of the. You might say to yourself, "Well, forty five thousand dollars—that's that's not nothing. It's not nothing." And you know, and it's so it's not median, but how much do you, do you have a number for how much they're paying for their their health insurance? I do not have a specific number because it varies a little too much. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But what I do per have, family, yeah. but for many of them, what this means is that forty five thousand dollars salary looks a lot more like twenty four thousand dollars at mm-hmm. the end of the at the end of the year yeah. after all their bills and all they have managed. Yeah. It looks a lot more like they're earning in the mid twenties. Yeah, that that sounds about right. And many of these people are lifelong teachers. These are people who have been teachers for 30 years. They're still making in the mid-20s effectively after their health insurance premiums and after all the other costs. Right. You know, they're taken out of their pay. And they are spending an enormous amount of their own money taking care of their students in ways that the state is not. Is not. Including... Feeding them. Yes. As they go, so this is a actually a very serious issue. issue. Uh, West Virginia has a um, a challenging environment for SNAP benefits, as many states do. And so there are some schools where th- more than 300 out of 400 students receive free and reduced school lunches for breakfast and lunch. And these are the bulk of their meals for the day. Yeah. They, so, get, they get free free breakfast and lunch and... It's the majority of the kids in the school. It's the majority of kids in the school, and this is the majority of their calories. Yeah. And many of these schools have a food, a Friday food pantry where they send the students home with food for the weekend. That's amazing. Um, and now while they're on strike, they've used their own money, and they're already in poverty themselves. And that, plus the school supplies, like the, the basics. Oh, and they're buying the school, school supplies, supplies basically, you know, pencils, and, you know, papers. You know, they, they are the ranked... Basics. In in set terms of salary, they are ranked forty eighth in the country. Yeah, forty eighth in in yeah. the the rank of all states. It's states uh, for uh, in lowest pay. Yeah, so they 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 have some of the lowest pay in the country for teachers, but they've taken some of their own money to ensure that their students aren't going to go hungry. Yeah. while school's out of session, they're organizing and they're collecting donations and they're they're getting, you know, they say. Uh, um, Costco or not Costco? Um, Actually, it was it was like Sam's Club or something. Was Sam's it? Club was right. donating food. Donating food, so children are getting fed. So uh, just to just to back up a minute and say what we're really saying, teachers struggling to get a fair salary, right, and benefits, right, are putting their jobs at risk, putting their incomes at risk, everything at on risk. strike. And while on strike, fighting for themselves, they're still so concerned for the students that they're busting their butts to make sure they get fed. to make sure these kids are fed. They're setting up pantries and and um, like right. pick up points where kids can come in and get food. They're even delivering meals to their homes to the to the homes right. of the kids while they're not in school, mm-hmm. and they're recruiting corporate donations. Yeah, in order to help feed these kids. Right. This is we're supposed to be the wealthiest country in the world and this, this is, is what we're reduced to. This right. is what our teachers are reduced to. Are reduced to doing. And I should put time. this in context. I'm not actually a school fan. You, you may have guessed. Public you're not a big fan of public schools. I'm not a big fan of schools. Or any schools. <laughs> right? Um so um this isn't about school exactly. This is about working people getting yeah. a fair share. Yeah. Getting a fair shake. If you're going to hire somebody to do something, you have a moral responsibility to pay them enough to live on. And if you are going to, I think if you're going to put kids in school, the people teaching them should be compensated well enough that they can, they can do a good job. Do a good job. 
exactly. Yeah. yeah, so, and that's another part of the strike. Since it's a wildcat strike, none of them are getting strike pay. Mm -hmm. They're all just not getting paid. They're just not getting paid. And right. most likely they have very little to no savings. Yeah. So this is um, a huge risk, but like I said, or like was said by one of the teachers, apparently a state full of teachers has nothing to lose. That's pretty amazing that it's gotten to that point. It's, it's utterly breathtaking. Fif what, 55 counties? Yes. 55 counties, hundreds of schools. Yes. It's it's really breathtaking. It's I, This is the largest labor action I've seen in about 40 years. What was the, the last one you remember? Air is controller strike. Yeah, under Reagan. Yep. Yeah. That was the last big labor action I recall. And Reagan's response broke them. Right. And effectively right. broke labor uh, unions for decades. Right. Um, and mind you, the they union were, they were regulated. They were they were highly regulated, um, like federal employees. Right. So he had that authority. He had the authority to do that. I don't think that forty five can 40, really do anything. No, I, I I don't think so. And he but, could send in the national guard or something. He might. Don't yeah. Don't laugh too hard. Don't laugh too hard. No, because yeah. they've been they were occupying the state capitol at one point. Yeah, yeah. They actually had taken over the state capitol. Yeah. Um, this is. This is the real deal, guys. I mean, it's it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, because the, again, the barricades. Are the, the union, barricades. the union is so broken. The union's not actually allowing to do supporting this. They're not getting straight. This this is the teachers themselves taking collective action. Yeah. And doing this organizing solidarity with each other and with and with their kids. With their kids, yeah. We, we this can't it can't be like this. So. Um, in contrast, the state teachers union reached an agreement shortly, like two or three days into the strike, yes. with the governor, which the legislature did not act on at all. They they didn't take it up to uh, approve no. the, the pay raise, and right. then and it was I've kind seen, of a measly this, concession. It know? was measly. I've seen these confused things where they were promising like they'll get one percent a year or something like that, which, it's, a it, that, which does not even cover cost of living increases yeah. that are happening every year, even though inflation is relatively low right now. Mm -hmm. Cost of living is high, is going up faster than official inflation reports. That's Correct. a whole other topic. Um, and I believe that this energy um, has, I won't, I won't say exactly has spawned, but it's, it's traveling. Oklahoma teachers are now preparing for another, for a strike much like this. A statewide strike of all teachers in the state walk out. They've been sicking out for months. So this could spread. This could spread. And this could be a really big deal. I, yeah. I'm hoping for yeah. it, you know? Because this is actually, I think this is actually much more vital and important than electoral politics. I hear, I hear from friends on Facebook mm -hmm. that the teachers in my old high school, Harbor Creek Junior Senior High School, mm -hmm. have been operating without a contract for months and months. They've been trying Jesus. to negotiate and, con and make offering concessions, mm -hmm. and the concessions are not, ex you know, not accepted. Right. Uh, they don't, they don't have a, a contract, and so you know, I want to. <laughs> I would like to encourage this to spread. Honestly, they hot. go on strike. People. I'd like to encourage the. The teachers, I you know, I doubt if there are any teachers that that you knew that I knew that are still there. There may be a couple. Well, there's I probably know. some. I, I don't know, but um, if there are, you know, within the sound of my voice or whatnot, I mean, do it, strike, do it. You know, it's time. It's, it's time. And support it's each past other. Time. It's, it's past time. time. Uh, it's a terrible thing to be a teacher in 2018. It's, well, and I let's just I, I know there are there may be some listeners and there probably are. Oh, sorry, some folks who um are kind of like, well, can we pay them more than that? I mean, you know, what can we do? I mean, is it, is it actually, I mean, and there were these people, these people are always around, and I, and I, to be clear, I deeply value these people. They bring a skill set to conversations that I don't have. I'm not trying to, you know, vilify anyone. Mm -hmm. But there's a question out there, it's like, you know, can, can we pay them more? Can we pay them more? Well, can our budget <laughs> allow that? <laughs> if your budget can allow that, you better rethink your budget. You need to rethink your budget. Yeah. So, seriously, and there's there's also this um, uh, a great meme about you know that if you're <clears throat> paying people less than what they need to live on, then you don't you're not running a business, right? Yeah. Yeah. You're not managing your business, and no. it's true. We have so many distortions in our economy. A lot of local businesses. Yeah. Um, basically depend on the minimum wage being suppressed. Yes. Function. Yeah. And they also depend on 
uh, the benefits programs, the right. state benefits, they defend, they, you know, SNAP benefits. They, they depend on SNAP benefits. They, they depend because, on child care benefits. Yeah, because without them, their their um, employees would actually not be able to feed themselves. Right, and so it's not just corporations that are are leaning on this. A lot of a lot of local businesses are also leaning on public benefits and suppression of the minimum wage to stay open. Right. Mm-hmm. So. Um, there's a much larger budget question to ask other than, well, looks like West Virginia has $10 and we've got to spend it this way. <laughs> because um, the I mean, question the, you need to ask is, where's is West Virginia getting the $10 from? Yeah. I mean, there's there's issues everywhere. Like, I mean, this is a big issue with teachers, but here in, in Michigan, driving on these roads, we've got a huge infrastructure problem. Roads <laughs> are literally how's you know, when, how's crumbling. They're closing stretches of road. Yeah, that's how is infrastructure. They're, they're closing stretches of roadway because yeah. they're so hazardous to drive on. Hazardous to drive, and they, and they can't fix them. And they can't fix them. There's no, you know, they, they've been patched and patched and repatched. Patched, the patches re-patched. won't stick to each other anymore. And this anymore. is the third wealthiest county in the state, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, and so we can't so afford to pave the roads. We can't afford to pave our roads, and so well, some things. I mean, like they're looking now. Is there some funding they can? So mm-hmm. what are they going to cut to do? What are they going to cut to do this? Right. Clearly, we just have to rethink budgeting and altogether. taxing and well, priorities. It's not a big altogether. It's not a big rethink, though. I I, to, I I know this is a spoiler. I don't mean to do that, but yeah, we we really don't have to think that hard <laughs> or that close or that deeply. You're going to suggest a. Uh, Something that libertarians libertarians hate this one. This one trick. This one weird trick. <laughs> we could stop giving away the store to corporations. Yeah. Yay. Hey! <laughs> How about we stop giving away the store to corporations, right? So if those, and let, let me just kind of break this down for you, okay? Yeah. And we'll use West Virginia as an example. Mm-hmm. That's what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. But it's everywhere. Yeah. So West Virginia has, for decades... For scores of years, scores and scores of years, given away the store to energy interests, coal, etc., coal, natural gas, etc., mining interests, mm-hmm. and they get tax breaks to locate there because they hire people. How great! They get tax breaks on any of the um, so like there's going to be a, a fine for their de- uh, environmental degradation. We waive that. The state absorbs the cost. Yeah, that's another yep. tax giveaway. Yep. Um, and health problems that ensue from the work in the mines. Then yeah. again, they're not they're not actually obligated. Maybe like West Virginia, yeah. um, uh, what is it? Medicaid will absorb the cost of that. Again, but clean coal. It's a tax giveaway to the corporation. Yeah. And if you do that for sixty years and longer, you'll notice that your savings account is thin because you've given it all away. <laughs> given it all away. Right? Because the corporation does not actually reinvest that money. No. This is, I'm going to tell you something really funny. No, it's sucked out. No, it, this, the is, state. this is the craziest thing, right? Yeah. So the corporation like earns all this money. They make all this profit. Mm-hmm. And ostensibly they should be paying taxes. Yep. Right to the state. But instead of paying those taxes, they get these tax <laughs> rebates because they're providing jobs. And the theory is all these people with these jobs from the corporations will then pay the taxes. But those taxes... For them. For the company somehow. But here's the... This is what's so hilarious, right? Those taxes then are what funds the tax rebates that the yeah, yeah. corporation gets. So they're actually getting back what they're paying people. They're getting back what they're paying people. This is a, so, a, a important point. This it's is an important huge point. point. They get it's, the... Right. It's like when... You know, it's it's a real WTF like, that's going on here moment. At yeah. the end of the day, like wipe away all the sort of like uh, hand waving. They're not and paying look at any, the bottom line. They're not paying anyone anything. They're not paying anyone anything, and they're getting all the money. Yes. At the end of the day, absolutely. They don't pay their employees. After all said and done, they haven't paid their employees. Yep. Like some money passed through their employees' hands. Right. But. They haven't actually paid their employees. They haven't paid and, their taxes. They're just walking away with the money. And the, the employees, the, the money that they did get, besides being taxed on it, right? What the, what little they spent, which was everything they had, everything they because had. they're not no one has any savings anymore, right? Is all going to back to Walmart, back and to Walmart, and, Sam's and, all, Club other, and all the it's other like, corporations. <laughs> it's deeply absurd. It's complete yeah. theater of the absurd. It's really yeah. It's really absurd in the in the Jean Paul Sartre sense, of, right? Yeah, so. And so, um. And, and as an added bonus, West Virginia, which is a magnificent 
part of the country has just been is, blown up. It's getting destroyed. Is d- destroyed. Like the physical Mountaintops landscape removed, is just demolished, streams demolished, plugged destroyed. up with toxic waste. Yeah, it's. I mean, it looks like what they've done. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like the physical landscape plundered, reflects what's happened. Plundered. So, um, don't talk to me about whether or not West Virginia can afford it. West Virginia can afford it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's not about affording it. It's about not handing away the store. Yeah. I mean, it's it's grotesque, it's obscene, and this is what it looks like at the end of the day. And I understand that a lot of those West Virginia teachers who are on strike right now voted for these policies that had handed away the store. Yeah, sure. And all of us, we, we like to vilify people. And this was actually my favorite uh, meme about this. Um, all the papers were there to talk to like these sort of... Um, Poor Trump voters, poor for, you know, voters for this current administration. Oh, yeah, yeah. All of yeah. them were there Yeah, the, talk about even, white supremacist even groups. Even o- overseas, like, you know, overseas. The Guardian was sending people to interview uh, folks at diners in Saginaw. At diners you in know, Saginaw. Let's, let's ask these, let's ask let's the these racists yokels. what they think. So what right. do the racists think, huh? Right. And, and to review white supremacist group, yeah, groups. Yeah, but when give them, Let's give them airtime. Airtime. On all the airtime we can. Right. Yeah. Um, but as soon as this deep broad union labor action takes place yeah it's like crickets they're not there for no them. one's there for it. no one's there to hear about no. it so um and the fact is all of us make political decisions that conflict with our best interests yeah because we're doing the best we can right and so on that aside they've taken a step now i like to call it stepping out in faith to try and make things better they have nothing left to lose. At this well, point. it is kind of a faith-based initiative. It is. Point, like it really is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm really humbled by their work. Yeah. It's amazing. I'm, I'm glad to see it. We should all be supporting them. Yeah. And spreading the word because. Yeah. Tell your friends. West Virginia is not the only state that has these structural problems by no, any means. Not by a long right? shot. So, and I, I think it's true. This is the only kind of action that's actually going to do anything. Yeah. Nothing else is going to work. Nothing else is going to do a damn no. thing. Electoral politics can't do anything about this cannot fix this can't fix this so i mean this is and this is kind of the tip even this is the tip of the iceberg yeah of direct action to make things better i hope so i do so yeah yeah it's um it's great news best news i've heard in a long time okay yeah i think we're gonna wind up there i think that's good You've been listening to the Grace and Paul Podcast. Check out the show blog with show notes for each episode at podcast.blogspot.com. You can leave comments there. You can also leave comments on YouTube. Or you can search for the Grace and Paul Podcast on Facebook or YouTube. I would try to read the URLs for the channel, but they're like blah, blah, Don't blah. Do all, it. These, all these characters. And it's we got insane. the links. It's insane. You we got, got the links. links. Just yeah, click so on it. So look at the links. Click. I'm not going to try and recite the those links <laughs> that's absurd thanks everyone take care bye bye have a good week Thank you.